Hi there. Welcome to the Stereoscope Podcast. This is our fifth edition. I'm Byron. I'm Anthony. And this month we have an incredible new guest. He's Matt Celia from Lightsail VR. Um, we've got a. We've got a. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we've got some. Uh, really interesting new video projects to talk about, and then Matt has some really cool stuff to show us uh, in the interview segment, and then um, we're going to talk about just the projects that you've been working on over the last few years. Cool. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, super stoked. Um, so we're just going to, we're going to do the news segment now. We've got some interesting projects that have popped up. It's been an interesting few weeks in the VR industry. I think VR video is really starting to just hit the ground running and or immersive video in general. And um, uh, that is proof positive because um, I just read about this. Elliot Page is producing a new production on, um, it's called When Brooklyn Was Queer, or at least it's, it was, it's, an adapt it's an immersive adaptation of this book about the history of queer Brooklyn. Um, what do you guys, what do you guys think about this? Um, I, I think... I think it's interesting that they're uh, really leaning into a specific space. What do you think? I mean, I think it's amazing. I, obviously, you know, I'm a fan of, of VR as a documentary tool. I think yeah, it's, it's an incredible for that. place for that. So I think this is sounds amazing to me. I mean, I, I I don't really have any other like. Well, I'll just have to see how it gets executed. But I think I'm very excited to see what comes out. There, there were a couple things that I think uh, really stood out to me in in the announcement for the production is that there's two specific. Um, companies that are working on it. One is um, MA Productions, and the other is uh, where is it? New Canvas. So um, these are two existing immersive production companies that have worked on other projects. I think MA. I couldn't really find anything else that they'd work on, but um, uh, but New Canvas had done Lustration, which was. Um, uh, a, a pre-render or a real-time rendered project and they also did Awake Episode 1 which was a volumetric real-time rendered thing. Matt, do you have any insight to this by any chance? No, I'd love to see what they've done but you know, I think anytime you get you get like very creative people involved in doing immersive stuff, it's really good for the whole industry and it's awesome that Elliot Page is doing that. It's a great platform to tell stories. Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I, so I think that the thing with new new Canvas that stru struck out to me was that they've they've done um, a couple other projects. So I'm I'm, but none of them were traditionally filmed, or at least yeah. the ones that I saw. Mm -hmm. There there were a couple uh, on their site that I think were 360. I don't think they were you know, VR 180, but Illustration sort of looked like it was. Um, made in Unity, possibly Unreal, um, but it had a uh, sort of a rotoscope, like a pseudo rotoscope mm -hmm. look to it. Um, so I think, especially with something uh, obviously in a book like this, um, when Brooklyn was queer, they don't have access to <laughs> uh, old timey Brooklyn, you know. So I, I think there's possibly a chance that they could use some sort of reimagining through real time, um, real time rendered stuff Yeah. in the same vein as illustration. I mean, this is all speculation obviously, but yeah. it really is good to see big name creators get into this space because unfortunately what we know is that lends a lot of legitimacy to these projects. Yeah. Um, I mean, Matt, you obviously have some insight hey, there. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. With with Eli Roth on your projects, how important was his involvement in getting these projects out the door? Well, I mean, you know, I think what was great about Eli is he's already a really avid VR enthusiast. You know, that's, like that's good to know. Let's go. When it first came out, he did this amazing uh, shark documentary that he filmed a ton of three sixty stuff. Um, with and, and sure, you know, he's going out, you know, a GoPro and doing it kind of on a like a more hobbyist level, but at the same time, like he's a great storyteller and he understands a lot about the medium. And so, you know, you have that, um, 
that energy behind something and it can really propel the creative forwards in a big way. So, you know, for all the projects that we've done, you know, in collaboration with Crypt TV, you know, I think you always feel that kind of energy of, of his, of his storytelling. And, you know, he comes from that indie background anyway. Yeah. Cabin fever. He really does. <laughs> so he's like, he's an in the trenches kind of creative. Um, it was always super inspiring, especially on like trick VR treat where she wrote and directed to just be on set, to watch him work. Um, you know, in many ways, I think we, some folks view immersive media as being very different than traditional storytelling, but I think that that, that's a, that's a big mistake. I mean, at the end of the day, storytelling is storytelling. There are techniques and, and things to be aware of, um, that do or do not work in either medium, but, you know, telling a story is, it's kind of universal. Yeah. Um, Cool. That was uh, exactly what we're looking for. Um, I'm also really interested in volumetric video too. So I, I wonder. I want to see volumetric video that doesn't look like an MIT science experiment. I want <laughs> right. to see volumetric video right. that looks like a real finished piece. And like, I hope that if they're going to go that route on this, that they don't do the thing where they just go to a festival with a half finished piece that like looks like it was done on a university program, like. Like for, for VR and immersive media to really break out and go mainstream, it's got to look good. Yeah. It's got to be polished. Like finished, it's got to yeah. have that level of finesse that audiences are used to. I mean, we're used to seeing Game of Thrones. I know that's kind of a dated reference now. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, when that came out, our jaws hit the ground because we didn't think TV could ever be that incredible. We're used to seeing House of the Dragon now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You yeah. know, it's and, and that's interesting that you mentioned that because um, there are some rumors in the immersive video community that Apple isn't interested in any project that doesn't have a large name attached to it. Um, yeah, I've heard that as well. And I mean, that seems very Apple of them. Um, but it also, you know, they want eyes on their stuff. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we're going to move on to the next part. Um, this is this one was a little bit of a out of left field thing. I did not see this coming at all. I don't really have a lot of context for it. Uh, I do like mechs and mech suits, so there is a some crossover there. But I don't really have any knowledge of Gundam whatsoever, other than um, a, a friend talking at me for about twenty minutes one time. Um, so, Mobile Suit Gundam Silver Phantom is an interactive VR anime movie, which. That's a mouthful, but um, w the more that I started to look at it, the more that I realized, like, this is actually pretty interesting because um, I don't know if you guys got to see the making of little YouTube video that they put together, mm -hmm. but, like, they're taking this fairly seriously. Like, it is a full, like, they've got storyboards, and this is not, this isn't just for a, like, a uh, a flat adaptation, like, this is like a VR animated movie. I don't know how long it is. It's probably like 30 minutes or something like that. But um, uh, yeah, so it's supposedly, this was said by um, one of the co-creators of the experience. This is not a game, nor is it just a narrative experience. It's an immersive adventure that leverages the best of both worlds. That's some very... Um, Lofty, lofty yeah. <laughs> ideals there, um, but what did really stand out to me was that Atlas Five is working on it, and so that means that, and this seems to be a recurring thing here, is that we get these long term because we we talked about Atlas Five on the last episode. Yeah, um, I mean they're a proven creator of great immersive content. Yeah, you know, time and time again, like they've just done great. I stuff. mean, I watched Gloomy Eyes like what six, seven years ago. Um, on my Oculus Go, you know, uh, right there. Um, so that's why it really did start to stand out to me. And I think um, I, I saw some of the, the pre viz stuff and the trailer that they put in. And um, hey, I'm going to watch it. I, I, I like mechs and I like space. Um, I mean, it, it, it seems like it's almost certainly being produced in Unity or Unreal, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that specifically it does seem like a little bit of cheating in terms of uh from a filmmaker's perspective because uh, you can put the camera literally anywhere you want <laughs> without any yeah. physical limitations but 
Um, That's true. But I mean, at the same time, like, I think, you know, the, for me, the most interesting narrative stuff being done in VR right now is the animation. Like, if you hop on to the quest and you look at all the Quill, Quill stuff. stuff. yeah, that's good. When point. we were prepping for the Faceless Lady, the director and I would sit in and we would actually watch a ton of the animation stuff because we found that we were learning a lot more cinematic techniques mm. and story techniques from the animation because people are playing much more fast and loose there. And, and I think that video has been stuck in this, like, we're going to make a documentary with a static camera, mm -hmm. which is fine, but, I mean... We, we've been doing that for the last half a decade, yeah. you know, and we found a lot of inspiration in animation. So I love like, you know, Atlas five stories. I think they also tend to have their foot on the gas of like pushing forward narrative techniques. So when you say like mechs and anime, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have our, we have our own, uh, um, yeah. ideas about some uh, mech stuff, but, yeah, uh, our own lofty idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally understand. In fact, now that you mention it, um, I, re I remembered that Lustration was partially created in Quill. Cool. So yeah, yeah. This is relevant to the the previous thing. Anyways, I'm um, I'm excited for this. Uh, it's it seems like it's coming out in the next three to six months. I don't know how much it's going to move the needle in terms of, <laughs> but Gundam has a huge fan base, especially overseas. Um, so we'll see. I'm curious what the distribution is. Like, oh, I think, for sure. you know, outside of, um, you know, Apple TV plus now and, uh, MetaQuest TV, you know, what is the main distribution platforms for some of these larger things? I think that's, it's interesting. I mean, we'll see, especially after Google announces, Google and Samsung announced their headset. I can only imagine that Google is going to rush in with some exclusive, VR video projects. I mean, they did it back in the day, so there's no reason to think yeah. that they wouldn't do it now. Yeah. Um, and Samsung previously also had their own little gaggle of self-financed uh, or co-financed stuff. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Now. On to Spatial Fi. Spatial Fi. All right. So, um, yeah, I played with this a little bit, uh, but Matt, know. do you have any history with the Spatial Fi app? Do you know what Yeah, it definitely. I mean, we were using it uh, when I was on the first beta, just trying to get my head wrapped around MDHEVC videos yeah. and like working with stuff in the Vision Pro. I mean, I still think like got my Vision Pro. Right oh, here. nice. I'm, I'm you disappointed know, and, you're not um, wearing it through the whole podcast. <laughs> I, I should be, right? I'd be like, too <laughs> hope in his videos. Um, I think watching like spatial videos, which is not to be confused with immersive videos. They're yep. very different. Uh, is one of the greatest things about the Vision Pro platform. I mean, the fact that it pulls up your photo library, it has all those things there, is one of the biggest strengths of Apple. Um, and it kind of reminds me, you know that scene in Minority Report where like Tom Cruise is having the memory and there's mm -hmm. like a hologram in front of him? That's like exactly how it feels. It's why yeah, like that the, horrible like the... moment where he remembers his dead family. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was enthralled. <laughs> no, but I really, I really love it. And, um, you know, I've been doing a lot. I actually got a, um, I have this like peak design oh, tripod nice. for my iPhone. Perfect. Just so that I could have a nice level oh, nice. thing for capturing spatial videos. So that's like perfectly nice. level and still, which makes them a lot more comfortable to watch. Um, and, you know, I do, I film tons of my kids and spatial fi being able to film at a higher resolution, I think is, is great. So An um, Anthony, you tested this out. Yeah. I was going to say how much have you tested? Cause like, so what I found is that you can film at 4k 30, but the export is still 1080. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you notice any big difference of like quality wise? So far, no. What I noticed is that the field of view is wider through Spatial mm -hmm. than the native app. That makes sense. So it's like maybe, I don't know why Apple might be cropping in slightly more, but otherwise my initial testing, and I'll have a little bit more to say maybe about Are you going to drop in a clip? I'll definitely be dropping in clips okay. here because I did, uh, you know, a, a comparison between the iOS version and then the three different flavors you can shoot in. Spatialify. My biggest like hang up with Spatialify, that I'm, aside from the resolution mm -hmm. restriction there, is that you can't control the exposure at all. Like at least in the iOS app, you can do the tap and scroll yeah. it down to get things a little more where you want them. Hopefully they'll they'll add that's that. That's gotta in be yeah. That's gotta be because they just got the camera thing working, so I'm sure. Yeah. So you said you you couldn't 
really see any difference quality wise. No, I, but it is hard to compare because I was able to get different exposures out of the. Uh, uh, yeah. But I didn't see anything different. But I'm also not doing it in a natural way. I was doing it more of a studio lit way. So like, that doesn't really reveal like the real mm. weaknesses in shooting uh, spatial video are when you're in low light yeah. and one camera is right. like super fuzzy and the other one's nice and sharp. You know, that's. Yeah. Uh, but. But no, no, no huge differences. What I did notice too is that you know how you can do the uh, upload to your Quest and view them in Quest. That yeah. doesn't really work. Like you can do the upload and everything, but they, those files will like eventually stall out and stop playing. I wonder if it's a in the Quest difference app. in bitrate. It's got to be, yeah. but I don't know. It could be. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I don't know what the bitrate is. I mean, everything. Actually, no. With it was MBHVC is a bit of a black box right now. Yeah. Yeah. But, and to be well and. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. So I don't really know. Now that I, I was about to say something, but it was only after I did the exports, they were all roughly the same file sizes, but clearly the export is altering the files. So yeah. I, I also think that uh, spatial video is really interesting because um, I don't know if you watched the last episode, but we dropped in a couple spatial videos into the podcast um, inside of an existing 3D video. And it... Oh. It actually worked very well, I'm really a, well, a and of, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're sort of playing around with it uh, in terms of because that's something that I actually really think that immersive video is good at is uh, screens inside of other experiences uh, tend to I, I'm sort of obsessed with the concept. Um, I really like it. I think it's an interesting use of space. Um, in terms of narrative stuff, it's a little bit harder, but with um, stuff that's not as locked down to a traditional yeah. storytelling uh, format, I think it actually works really well. Um, you can see sort of all of my ideas historically have revolved around some sort of second screen experience or... Yeah, um, yeah. yeah we call that we call that AR and VR over here. Yeah. It's kind <laughs> of like, it's this vibe of like having an AR, advanced AR headset on your face almost, where you yeah. can like have super zoom and like, <laughs> right. yeah, you know, like one of the big problems in VR is you don't have like close ups. I'm glad I, people keep uh, updating that stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's a really healthy like open source community build, building MVHEVC. You know, Mike Swanson's doing a bunch of really interesting things. Um, I released a, uh, an open source video player app for Vision Pro, like based on like his work. Like, I think. It's it's nice that there's like a community of folks that are like really invigorating. It does feel a little like 2016 all over again. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, that's kind of fun. All right, so we're out of the news segment, and um, we're just going to go into the interview uh, discussion part now. Um, cool. I guess uh, we're we'll, we'll just do it the easy way. Um, so big big question that I ask pretty much all of our guests and it seems to be uh, a lengthy intro into everything else is how did you get into immersive video? Cool. Yeah. I'm happy to share my story. Um, it's a long road uh, to get here, but basically about 10 years ago, um, I was trying to make it as commercial director and I just made a feature length documentary with my wife and we were shopping around uh, like Oxygen and OWN and, you know, a bunch of cable networks. And uh, my manager at the time, Robert Watts, who was also a college friend of mine, we weren't getting any traction. It just was a lot of like just closed doors and no's. Yeah. And it was frustrating because we felt like it was a really good film. Uh, the film's called Off the Floor, by the way. Uh, and it's a story of women who are trying to take pole dancing and make it into an art form. And it's a big women's empowerment film that I made with my wife, and it's a really good story. It's actually coming up on its 10-year anniversary, which is crazy to me. Congrats. Um, but, you know, he comes over to my house one day, and he hands me uh, his phone with a cardboard attached. And he says, hey, I just saw this. I think this is going to be, like, really cool one day. You should check it out because you're kind of a technical, technical guy. And I put it on and I watched um, Walking New York was the first piece that I saw ever in VR. Um, a Chris Milk's company at the time was like turning out some really interesting. Content. And I was like, this is really interesting. This is cool. Like I'm in the middle of the story. I'm in the middle of the, uh, the action. But for me, I kind of felt like there needed to be more. Right. So I went to VRLA uh, that year. 
down in L in Los Angeles, and uh, I watched like everything I could find. And I was sitting on this this panel called Storytelling in VR. Because I'm a narrative guy. Like I'm a filmmaker. I went to film school. I like to make movies. And in this panel, I remember the moderator goes, "What's your favorite story in VR?" And and one of the guests there, who I assumed was important because they were on the stage, you know, he says, "I was on Mars." And that was like the end of his answer. <laughs> and I go, so, "I think you and I have different opinions <laughs> on what a story is. Like, what happened on Mars? Did you save the Earth from an alien invasion? Did you find twenty dollars? Did you like escape with your life? Like." Like, where's the conflict? Where's the emotion? Where's the storytelling? And uh, and that was a similar feeling I felt to all the pieces I saw at VRLA. It's like, I was like, this is really cool. But as a creative person, I felt like the stories I wanted to see in the storytelling, the narrative of it all, didn't exist. Mm. I called Robert up and I said, hey, man, I'm going to go buy a bunch of GoPros. Do you want to go half on it? with me and he was like sure and one of the insights i saw from watching all that stuff is a lot of people are shooting with six gopros which puts the seam line straight down the middle of your action yeah and i thought that was really dumb <laughs> so, of like, course we need, so i was like we're going to do the 10 camera gopro that prioritizes the horizon so we can get like the most amount of coverage and the best looking image the cleanest stitch where our characters are sitting mm -hmm. and where our action is in the scene so we bought 10 GoPros. We started making a bunch of really terrible videos, um, learning how to stitch and auto pano. And uh, I kept producing and working in the 2D world. And I got a phone call from a friend of a friend who had saw that I posted my VR rig on Facebook. And he said, hey, I'm working with this big company. Uh, we're gonna do this paranormal activity, 360 seance. It's written by the writers of the film. Uh, and this company I was working with, they just pulled out. I'm screwed. I what do this what year weeks. was this? This is 2015. So this would have been around the time of Paranormal Activity 4. Yeah, the, the, the Ghost Dimension. The 3D the one. The yeah. release of the Ghost Dimension, yeah. which launched in December for Christmas that year. And, uh, and he said, like, I saw you have a VR camera. Like, can you help me out? I'm in a huge bind. And I was working on a set of a horror movie time or horror like marketing assets for uh an stx entertainment property and uh i was like absolutely you know so i just like walked around to my crew and i was like hey can you work on this saturday you want to come work on saturday you want to work on the saturday i called my we were moving i called my movers i'm like hey can you clear out my whole garage like a couple days early <laughs> you know? and so like we just took all the set design from this like marketing assets we filled my garage with it and we we filmed this like 10 minute vr video that was like an in-universe original it was a narrative storytelling horror piece with real actors with real characters shot on a real camera it wasn't like this. this it wasn't this like you know cheap 3d ps1 looking thing where everything scares at you instead yeah. you're watching people actually be scared mm -hmm. which was what i thought was like really missing like you know it's easy to be ignoring when stuff just coming at you but when you see someone else scared that's when you're afraid and uh yeah we shot it and it got like 10 million views overnight it just went super viral um and people started sending us videos of themselves watching it <laughs> and and we would so we were like this must be really cool so we would go to all these conferences you know the time vr was taken off so there's all these expos and conferences and and robert and i would have samsung gear vrs in our backpack with you know this paranormal activity piece loaded up and like what terrible people were we that we would walk up to anyone important looking and be like hey have you seen vr and then they were usually like no and i'd be like you want it you want to? And I'd be showing them paranormal activity, <laughs> like horrific piece where like people get brutally murdered. <laughs> but it was, it was really visceral and it was really good. I thought, I still think it's like, I mean, it feels dated now, but I still think like it was really good. And, and the sound was great and it felt like it was, it belonged in the paranormal activity universe. Um, and it did move the needle for a lot of folks. And we start all about like, Hey, can you um, do this thing for GoPro? Can you do this thing for Google? Can you do this? And, you know, Robert and I just kept saying yes to really cool opportunities and trying to always put 
forth this idea of story first, story first. I feel like now it's like way overused as a word, but you know, when I say story, I really mean it's got character, it's got conflict, um, and it's got some emotional resonance. Like you have to come away feeling something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of been the lifeblood of our company um, for the last almost 10 years now. I think it's, uh, that's incredibly important. I mean, so I think I love paranormal, paranormal activity. It's actually one of my favorite franchises. I think a lot, it gets a lot of hate now, but it like changed the industry. I mean, talk about ultra low budget, um, uh, and sort of took what Blair, which, you know, started, started yeah. and then iterated on it in a really compelling way. I personally think the third one is the best of all of them. Um, I love that movie. Anyways, um, we're going to move on, but, uh, but this dovetails perfectly because what do you think is the future of this industry? And I think you just said it, but I may be wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot that's exciting about what's going on right now. Um, but I also think that we're just still getting more narrative techniques. Um, and when you think about it, if you were to count like the real big narrative pieces done in this medium that have like moved a needle, I mean, it's hard to fill two hands, right? Yeah. Like, like what? There was Invisible. There was a Hero. That mm -hmm. was like a one-off kind of monster flick that Google did. I liked that um, one. That one was good. What, what was it? Oh, I liked Hero. Yeah. And Hero was good. You know, Hero was good. Uh, I think Felix and Paul did Miyubi. That was in narrative. Yeah. Piece. Um, you know. Oh, gosh. It, it's not that. There's not. There, there are examples, like there's definitely examples, but outside of something that was done for like a marketing campaign, mm -hmm. there's not that many. And I really think that, um, that there's an opportunity to, to push forward some of that. And I, you know, we talked earlier in the show about interactivity. I still want to explore that. Like, I still think that there's a world where, because you're in the narrative and you're like, actually like surrounded by stuff and you're, it makes choose your own adventure projects in my mind a yeah. little more native rather than like when you watch Bandersnatch, you're behind a screen, it stops the action so you can make a choice. Like that feels yeah. so clunky to me, you know? But like immersive theater, that's that's where I think like some storytelling in VR can go. And I'm I'm actually surprised that we haven't seen more things like Sleep No More adapted to immersive media. I mean, you said you had worked on a project before the podcast started, we were chatting. Um, uh, you had worked on a project that sort of tried to adapt that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, and this is so dated, I don't even think it works anymore, but it was called Speak of the Devil. Um, and we took basically the same crew that made that paranormal activity thing, because we'd done a few projects with them, you know, and we had like a lot of goodwill with them. And we produced this thing for like no money up in the, up in the forest in Big Bear. And it, it's a uh, it's an interactive horror project with 56 unique locations over about a square mile of forest wow. and 150 some odd videos or things that can happen. And, you know, depending on where you are and where who you've met and what part of the story is, it changes what happens in each of these locations. So, for example, you start you're at a campsite. It's sunny. It's awesome. You know, you meet your characters. They're like, we're going to go off to find this, like, weird cryptic tomb thing. And then, you know, a few hops later, they find it. Spoiler alert, the demon comes out, <laughs> right? And then if you return back to the campsite, the campsite's now, like, moodier. It's, like, later in the afternoon, and there's creepy sounds, and, like, there's, like, a weird demon creature running around the woods. And, like, you know, we're just trying to, like, up the... How did how did you release this? What's well, right? How did you release this? So we released it on Oculus on okay. the Oculus Rift. And and it was, was it a standalone app? It was a standalone app, and okay. it was built in Unity with uh, the concept of like you had like a hero video and a loop video. Mm. And you know, my take on inter interactive videos was we should never stop the action at any time. There should never be a moment where like you know the characters like pick me or pick or me pick me or yeah. Part. Or there's like two like words on the screen, like because all of that feels like you're taking the world out of being present. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of making immersive media is that you want the audience to feel present yeah. in the space, 
So we kind of designed it a lot like Sleep No More, where characters would come in, they would interact, they would do a little thing, you know, and then they would run out because something would grab their attention in a narratively justified way. And you could choose, do I follow them? Or am I like, that's a whole bash of crazy. I'm going to go this way. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it reminds me a lot. There was a there was a interactive zombie film that came out in like 2007, 2008. And it was shot here in Portland. And uh, there was a short, there was a short project that I was working on. And one of the actors that we auditioned um, ended up being the lead from this film that I'd seen, you know, about oh, five or 10 years previous to it. Um, but it was, it sounds a lot like what you were describing, but it was a Java project. And so oh, wow. Java is not supported anymore. So you can't access this production. <laughs> it is now lost to time. And it was the only method of interactivity that they had for it. So they, they'd have to rebuild the project from scratch in a new, in a new engine if they wanted to. Oh, wow. I, I, I think Speed of the Devil is still in the Oculus store, but I don't, I don't recommend grabbing it because I don't <laughs> think it works okay. anymore. Uh, I'm pretty sure they've all updated their SDKs and we haven't touched the code base. That is, that is a big problem for a lot of these uh, interactive projects is that once, once the, the platform that you're using stops supporting that engine, how how do you make Big problem sure? for immersive in general like think about all the films jaunt made where are they? they're they gone yeah they don't exist like, anymore like i teach a lot of workshops and, and and you know and students about immersive media and i'm always bringing like these pieces that were touchstones for me that like you know they did some things well they did some things not so well i can't find them anymore and and then if I do find it, it's at such a low resolution and quality, it's not even worth looking at. I know it's better. Like, you know, there's a brilliant film in the Amazon that Jaunt produced that's I think Celine Tricart was the DP on, and she's a phenomenal filmmaker. And and it's just some amazing shots of the Amazon, and it only exists in this like horribly compressed, like mm. sub 4K version on YouTube. And you're like, I know the job camera is capable of much more than this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, this industry and has always had an issue with, uh, with putting archiving in, yeah. into a, an important uh, well, games it, and movies yeah. are just really bad at it. And I, I, yeah. it's, yeah, I feel yeah. like it's like that uncomfortable friction point between like the art world and the tech world. Cause the tech world's like, well, it's old. Who cares? It's gone. Who cares? Like, there's yeah. no need to have yeah, that anymore. Okay. You know. Uh, whereas, that's how you. If I, had, if I had billions of dollars, I would just I would be the like biggest VR archivist because I think that it's so important. I mean, I view really what we're doing now as like 1910. In agreed. The agreed. Agreed. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. Um, it's okay. We're gonna move on. Um, all right. So this one is, uh, I think. Different people have different takes on this, and I definitely have my thoughts on it. But what do you think differentiates immersive? I put VR 180 in my notes, but immersive video from flat filmmaking. Mm. That's a tough question, just because you know every project I try to do and work on, and this is a question we ask ourselves all the time: is like, why should we make this in immersive? Like, why is this better? being an immersive. And I've been on calls where I've told creatives on the other end of the phone, I've said, hey, I, I just, I don't think this project's gonna move the needle immersively. I think you should shoot it in 2D because that's yeah. what you want. Um, and I kind of really draw the line in the sand on that because I don't think that, you know, putting that round peg in a square hole is gonna do anybody any good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, for me, I look at, okay, do we gain something by transporting someone into a new environment, to a new place? Uh, for example, the concerts. Like, you're on stage at Red Rocks. Yeah. You can't buy a ticket mm -hmm. that good. I was looking at, so I was looking at the prices for, uh, it was a Perfect Circle, Primus, and Pucifer for a Red Rocks show at this soon. And it was like $700 for its per ticket. I was like, well, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, I mean, five VR headset would be that close. Exactly. Right? 
Um, um, one thing that I've noticed in between the differences between the two formats is something that comes up that I have a lot of very, very strong feelings about is the camera as POV, a subjective versus objective reality. Is what is the camera's relationship to the audience and what is the camera's relationship to other characters within the room? So I think it's really interesting because I also think that, you know, in your original question, you did put 180. And yeah. I think 180 is almost even a different medium than 360. They have very different oh, for sure. kind of <laughs> vibes, yeah. Yeah. right? In 360, I think you are much more like present in the scene and you feel like much more like I am a character and I have a POV. And, and you know, that doesn't mean that like it's hardcore Henry where you're looking down at a body and you're like moving all your stuff around, but you do exist. And I find that, there's stories where you being acknowledged in the space is really powerful. Mm. Um, you know, it's kind of like the, the analogy I use is if you go to a party and no one looks at you or talks to you or engages with you at this party, how long do you stay? Right? Yeah. You don't really feel very welcome in the space. Mm -hmm. And 360, I've always felt like that that's really important. In 180, though, like especially with the narrative work that we've done, particularly Be Mine and Trick, uh, and The Faces Lady, which is coming out, you know, um, I feel like you can be the ghost a little bit. And it just seems to work because it feels a little bit more like television. Yeah. And, you're, and it's more about just having something that's so huge that it feels good. And the cutting style's faster, right? Like, mm -hmm, it really yeah. just feels more like television, but, like, you're watching almost bigger than IMAX. Yeah. Oh. Um, whereas, you know, I've seen some really beautiful pieces that like the shots really linger for a really long time and you're kind of meant to look around and explore and like, those are the ones that I feel like camera placement, I feel like I need to always be in a place that I can be. Yeah. Well, while watching Be Mine last night, something that I really took a, a, a notice to was how, uh, how quick the, how often the cuts were, which was more than yeah. I've usually seen, mm -hmm. um, how traditional dialogue segments within like a room actually flowed incredibly well and felt mo much more like I was watching a traditional. a traditional project, but it also allowed me to engage with the characters in a way that was really natural in it, which is sort of the antithesis to, I think the way that most people mm -hmm. think about these types of Scene yeah, transitions. like you would traditionally put the camera like a, in a triangle, right? With the two characters, yeah, and right. your camera would be here, and you'd be like looking back and forth, and you play it all out. Well, like that doesn't really work in narrative, unless yeah. you have like really phenomenal actors, and it really kind of makes sense because a lot of what creates like modern day television is editing yeah. and yeah. and piecing the story together and getting the dialogue and the pacing right. And I'm really a fan of long takes. Like that's why I got into this. Same. But we spent a lot of time on Be Mine, like taking our sphere and going, what? How many degrees are people standing? What's the height of everybody? Where's the eye lines of everybody? And like doing a lot of tests on over the shoulders of like, how? What is this language? Like, where do we put the camera? How do we intercut between the two? Where are we looking? And like, you know, editing in VR is very much about anticipating audience eye lines more than it is about cutting on action. Mm -hmm. so we think more about where is the audience looking and less about what's happening on the screen. I mean, of course, that's important because what's happening on the screen drives where you're looking. But, you know, I see pieces all the time where I think they cut too early. Yeah. You know, where like I'm following someone and then they cut and that someone's back over here. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? Right, right. You know? See, these are a lot of discussions that we've been having for a couple of years now. And um, I think Be Mine and specifically The Faceless Lady are some of the clip that we saw that we'll show later. Um, uh, so these are some of the first times that we've seen the things that we've been talking about used in the ways that are exactly the ways that we've been talking about. Yeah. And okay. it, it's very... Um, encouraging. Encouraging. <laughs> and it, it's it, cool, it, right? I mean, but it's not, it's not everything always works. Right. You know, yeah. like I think that there's shots in Be Mine and in The Faceless Lady that are really interesting but don't always work yeah you know and they don't always work for everybody in every setting right. and i think a lot of what's really tough right now is you've got many ways to view the, this content and then you also have an audience that is very fragmented 
You have oh, VR sure. enthusiasts that have been in VR, have VR legs, can handle moving camera, can handle fast cuts, can handle stereoscopic stuff. And then, you know, 20 to 30 percent of people watching this stuff have literally never been in a headset before. Yeah. And if you even move that camera slightly, they're going to get woozy and they're going to feel sick. So I, I like... still suffer from fairly intense uh, VR sickness yeah. under the right circumstances. Um, but one thing that I was very impressed with from specifically uh, Be Mine and uh, Faceless Lady is that I didn't get any semblance of VR sickness whatsoever at any point. Um there were some elements of feeling uncomfortable, but that had more to do with like close talkers and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's also like when you're making horror, we have this discussion a lot about like, hey, I think this might make people feel uncomfortable, and then creatively go, well, it's a horror piece. We it's supposed to. It's supposed yes, to. Uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's a there's a couple scenes in like the Faceless Lady where we intentionally put the camera off axis, and we intentionally mm. kind of like mess with your worldview because something traumatic has just happened, and we want the audience to also feel that sense of disorientation like the characters in the screen are feeling yeah yeah and i think that that all really worked i think all the prep you did because I, I it was it, it kept striking me on all three pieces that like i was never looking in the wrong place when the cut happened i was always looking yeah. right where i needed to be for the very next shot so like all that paid off and i thought that was uh because most of the time i'm all, i'm looking over here and then like you say you're, they cuts to a shot and i'm like oh shit okay i gotta go over here now and it doesn't work and they're, they're kind of like a, a nice evolution of storytelling. Like Trick VR Tree was all direct to camera, like you're on a rails in a fun house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very scary, weird, mended fun house. <laughs> uh, and then Be Mine was like, okay, well, we're going to now approach it more like a television show and do a lot more cuts. Yeah. I mean, a lot more a lot cuts. More. We had, I think, something like 300 cuts in that 30 minute piece. It was intense. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Faces Liddy takes that a step further by going, hey, let's do six episodes. Let's do it in 3D. Mm -hmm. Like, let's tell, let's tell a serialized story, um, which also presents a lot of challenges. There, there's some things in Be Mine that I noticed. Um, there was some choices to use POV during dialogue, which yes. um, I, I have, uh, I'll just be very frank. I don't really like POV shots in... VR 180 stuff. Uh, I, I, I personally, it's not, I don't think that you can never use them. I just think that they're, they're a crutch for certain types of stories. And a lot of people get obsessed with that concept. And then they're not thinking out of the box or at least. I, I probably agree. I mean, I can't tell you how many like request proposals that we've had where it's like, we are POV. And yeah. like VR does not always mean POV. Yes. yes, you may be in the present in this space, but you know you can't really be the protagonist in a story, because then how how do you grow in a meeting where you can't give back? Nothing can like, you can't contribute anything, and nothing can happen to you. Anything, like it just yeah. does not work. And I know the shots you're talking about in Be Mine. It's like when we're in the library, which is yeah. a difficult scene. It was like the first day of filming, um, and it was one of those things that we were trying. And I think like we look back on that, we go like. Eh, I don't know if that really worked as well as we thought it was, but it was jarring at that moment. And like, you know, creatively we were thinking like, Hey, it'd be kind of cool to like wake people up here a little bit. Yeah. You know? There was, there was a sequence that I did like because it was more intentional. And I think it added, it was the, the first POV shot of the killer outside of the sorority house, which I realized yeah. was a direct allusion to black Christmas yeah, and uh, the POV shots from Black Christmas, um, which is one of the first POV killer shots in cinema, other than I think uh, that the other one by. Um, anyways, um, the heavy breathing. Like, yes, you know, exactly. And um, uh, Maniac. There we go. Uh, mm -hmm. Maniac was the first one, and um, that one I think worked because it was. Uh, it was an homage, but it was also putting you in the character of the killer at a certain point. And, and you know, it's also referencing Halloween, etc. But uh, that thing, things like that, creative decisions like that, I think, work in ways that um, help the project along. But I think you have to have a motivated reason to switch your POV in any project. Yeah. You know, you just have, you, have, you have to have a motivated reason to cut. You have to have a motivated reason to do anything. And, like... The problem is that sometimes we try things and then we realize that we're just trying them because we're, we want to experiment with them, but 
the motivations are a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah. Anthony, you had some, you had some stuff. Some more technical stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm happy to geek out about the tech. That's yeah. What I, love. I mean, it's, some, love it's funny because I wrote some of the questions and then I watched the behind the scenes. I was like, okay, well, that answers some of them. <laughs> but uh, you know, so that's I guess, a great. You know, the one that Eli Roth did for Trick Beer. So that's good. A great piece. It's yeah, so it's, it's such like, a great people, piece. Yeah. People should really watch that because it's really fun. Yeah, it really is, and it, and it's very uh, enlightening. You know. Uh, but yeah, so one of my questions was. Uh, about the camera, but I feel like at least on uh, the haunted house one, that was um, it looks like a Venice with just an ultra wide. Is that right? Like a Sony Venice? Is that what it was? No, so, Trick Bear Treat and Be Mine were both shot on Venice on the Venice twos. Okay, actually, Trick Bear Treat I think maybe was Venice one and Be Mine was Venice two. That would that would make sense. Um, yeah. And it was shot with a two hundred degree lens um, from Antonia. I think that's how you said it. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and uh and it was good and uh, and it worked really well but it was mono you know which is my next question and, <laughs> yeah and i think like you know i always wish that those were stereo yeah i think that they would have been really cool if they were, they were 3D. yeah that was effectively the first thing that we commented on was man i wish this was in 3d i know and because it's so much more immersive and like 180 as a format really should be stereo because like one of the main reasons to shoot 180 is that like this stereo works and like and it's easier and it looks the effects good. are much much harder in 3d they're so hard and and the time <laughs> it takes to produce it so you know yeah. the real reality is that at the end of the day you have only so many resources available to you budget and time and if you're going to spend that money on technical stuff rather than putting the money on the screen in terms of like production design and cast and like locations, like oh, always shit. better served doing Sorry. production design, <laughs> locations and all that stuff. Like you're always much, much better doing the things that are on the screen because a lot of people can't even tell the difference between monoscopic and stereoscopic. It's kind of, it's kind of silly. Yeah, which is why. Um, I can for sure. I absolutely it's, can. It's huge I'm, to me. Yeah. I mean, when w when you when you sent us the clip of the faceless lady, I instantly went, "Oh, well, there we go." <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, like the other reason is, is um, you know, the faceless lady, we prepped for that show for like two and a half months. Wow. And when we prepped on, you know, trickier or treat for like maybe a month, and then. I feel like Be Mine was like just an extension of Trick VR Treat because we wrapped Trick VR Treat and went immediately into production like a couple oh. weeks later into Be Mine. Like it was so fast. And so we recycled a lot of the same stuff because you just didn't have the time. And the way that you move the camera, the way that you tell your story, the way that you block your actors, when you're dealing with stereo, that's all different. Yeah. Like you have very real limitations. Yeah. Limitations. And I would say in The Faceless Lady, we come very close and maybe we even break a couple of those and some of them may work and some of them don't work. Like we really push the limit on how close you can get, where you block people, how you set the stage of tableaus. Um, and, you know, I think that that was part of the fun. And that's like part of what we're so blessed to be able to do is to really innovate and to really try things and push the envelope and get feedback from people about what worked, what didn't. We've really talked about, we've, we've talked about, um, we really want to work on an episodic production because we, we think that it'll help, um, iterate and, and, and test things. I mean, look at Star Trek, the next generation, one of the best television shows yeah. of all time. It, it, they were doing things on the fly that nobody had ever done in television before. And now it is a staple of the industry because they shot a feature film every week. And that, that that's sort of the level that we're on with these types of productions is that uh, you're iterating in ways that nobody has the time or budget to do in other places. Yeah. You said yeah. it before. It's like, we're watching this evolution happen in real time just yeah. with every iteration. Um, so each episode, I'm how long are the, the faceless lady episodes? The faceless lady, it's, it's six episodes of TV. They're between 22 and 25 minutes. Dang. That's like full episodes. Yeah. And there's six episodes. They all tell a nice arc. I think the writing is incredible. I think the acting is really good. I think the way that the director, John Ross, staged this stuff. And you, by the way, he had never made a VR film before. 
Fascinating. Wow. Both him and the DP had never done a VR film before, Impressive. never worked in 3D before. <laughs> Part of my job on this production was to help them, to help translate, to help solve problems, to help show them all the things that you shouldn't do, to show them the things that you should do, and then to talk about the in-between moments where, like, should we do this? Should we not do this? Well, what does that say? Like, hey, this stereo, the 3D, is going to really not for the first maybe we are doing that specifically so that we can drive attention to this part of the frame does that work i don't know like the audiences are going to be the judge right. like, were we'll there were there any ideas that maybe they like a like something stuck in their head that you were like that's not gonna um well i think like you know a lot of traditional filmmakers you know they're very they're used to moving really fast you know um really fast and you know uh, Brandon Gamma, who's the DP on this, is like a pro up and down. Like he is probably the best DP I've ever worked with. He's so, so good. And he moves at a very, very fast clip. And we had a very compressed schedule. But there were some things where, you know, as a DP, you're like, oh, I can put the camera on a road and we can just do this handheld. And I had to come in and just be like, you know what? In 2D, that works great because you can stabilize and do all this stuff. But in VR, that little bit of motion like this is going to make things really nauseating. So, yeah, we talked about this stabilization. Like, what's your stabilization rig look like? Because we've had our own problems with that. So we did something really cool, I think, on the faceless lady. Um, you know, Brennan wanted to move very quickly. And he was like, I really want to put the camera on a Ronin 2 and have it live on a Ronin 2 the entire shoot. Um... And, you know, we had the Ronin 2 with uh, with the operator, Rua, who is going to be on wheels mm -hmm. and panning and tilting. At first, I was like, guys, I really don't, I really don't know if this is going to work. Like, <laughs> you never pan mid-shot. You don't tilt mid-shot. Like, that's like recipe for nausea. And, uh, and Brendan was like, you know, I think we should, I think we should try it and see where we can push the limit. So we put up a bunch of camera tests and... We found something really interesting. One of the most uncomfortable movements in VR is this lateral movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Because it just feels like the world's swaying from you. Yep. And also, if you just pan the camera, super uncomfortable. Big no-no. We found that if we combine lateral movement with panning the camera... We talked about we this. Had we talked center, about this. We literally put... We literally put a piece of tape in the middle of the monitor mm -hmm. and Rua would like be on the wheels and keep that person locked dead center. It made for really comfortable, really interesting motion. Yeah, this and is we were able to do stuff we'd never been able to do before by dialing that in. We had to keep the speed kind of slow mm -hmm. and like, you know, we really worked together to try to figure that out. But I think that some of the way that we move the camera in the face of this lady has never been done before and feels really good. And again, you know, we're talking about the animation stuff that like John Ross and I kind of went into in prep. That's where we got some of these ideas, I think, is because, mm -hmm. you know, animation, they, they are a little bit, they're a little bit better about moving the camera and a little more adventurous, I think. I, I think there's, a, for some reason, rendered stuff, there's a better sense of, there can be a stronger sense of presence um and well, it's, a off. it's a sixed off nature yeah you know of all the cool stuff is all the cool stuff is sixed off and even when you move your head just this much you're getting parallax information yeah you don't get that in video and that that can be really disorienting yeah yeah it's for sure um but yeah it's interesting that you found that because that's what we have started to observe because there's the shot in the, in the clip that you've shared mm -hmm. uh you know where there's this tracking back and camera camera le uh, right all the way back for like several, I don't know, like a minute. So or that something. was yeah, done. Right? That was done on a. That was handheld. That was on a no track, nothing. That was just done on like. That's a, what it looks like. Weird like arms. I have the same with the ready rig. rig. Yeah, I have that. A, <laughs> like a ready rig kind of yeah. thing, but it looks more like a dock ock. Yeah. Type <laughs> thing. It was crazy. Um, but we stabilized that a lot too. Yeah. Like I would say, you know, out of the 318 visual effects shots, maybe a hundred of those were stabilization. Yeah. Nice. How how. We haven't gotten into much of the the post talk here. Um, so I think Lightsail seems to have a fully featured post uh, situation going on. Sounds like um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We are well. You know, one of the unique things about Lightsail is like we we do production really well, 
and we also do post really well. And this enables like the two heads to talk to each other, mm. um, which is really important because as a post house, we've been handed a lot of footage that was literally unstitchable and unworkable. And it was mm. like, we can't, we just can't. Um, and we don't shoot anything that we couldn't post ourselves. Uh, and by understanding the whole pipeline and understanding all the tricks and things that you can get away with, I think that's what allows us to keep pushing the needle a little bit and trying different things because we know what we can kind of get away with and we can do it all internally in house. Um, I want to get into maybe some logistical stuff. Like how did, how, what was the process of putting the faceless lady together in terms of a production in terms of producing? Yeah. I mean, you know, I can't speak too, too much to that because our role in the project really was more in the VR realm of things. Sure. You know, um, and you know, crypt, and the team over there, they did a really great job. And there's a huge machine of production that was outside a lot of what LightSail was doing. Because we were very focused on, hey, let's make sure we capture it right for VR. Mm -hmm. And then once we have the footage, we need to do all the proper, the 3D and the stereoscopic and the color grade and all that jazz. Um, I will say that it was, it was it's a full TV show. like. There's really extremely talented folks. We had an amazing crew over in Ireland um, where we shot. Um, and we had an Irish production partner over there that did just amazing work. And it was, you know, it was, it was a big beast. I noticed uh, we were there for 26 days. 26, filming. wow. I noticed that there's a lot of really impressive uh, location work on this production. And I think that's something that people don't really realize how much actual locations are super important in they're so important and i always say like your location in vr is like once you lock your location everything else falls into place because mm -hmm. it is so 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 important the castle that we found charleville castle in tomor it felt like it was built for vr it had <laughs> these like ornate ceilings with like all this 3d depth and it had it was a castle that wasn't built as a castle but it was built in the 1800s uh, by some rich land baron who wanted a party castle. Mm. <laughs> he just wanted like a castle that bring like host big balls and galas and stuff. And yeah. So it's like a romanticized version of a castle. And that's why I think it works so well for this kind of story. Um, yeah. Yeah. You have so, I mean, else? well, no, I mean, that was, I was the same, same thing that I noticed from it. Uh, because it affects the lighting so much, and so you're so limited in lighting in in VR 180 or whatever. So oh, I was like, really you got these hard giant windows. In this production, yeah. lighting was so challenging because you're yeah. filming on. We filmed on the Red V Raptor with the Canon dual fisheye lens, and um, it's a very high quality image, but it's not great in low light. We're filming 60 frames a second, mm -hmm. which is also not great in low light. That lens, you really want to shoot it at an f 5.6. Which is also not great in low light. Yeah, you got all and the so, challenges. So, you know, poor Brenda and the DP and Kevin, our gaffer, we're just like banging these huge HMI lights through these windows to try to get exposure on stuff. Yeah. It was very, very challenging. Yeah. And, of course, I'm there saying like, hey, you know, if you put a light in the shot, I got to paint it out later. So, like, <laughs> you know, the less times we do this, the better, you know, financially. Yeah. So, um, that that's actually something that I'm interested in is um, what does how how does painting something out in stereo affect uh that shot i mean if you're doing if you're doing a static shot which there's not very many static shots <laughs> if you're doing a static shot it's very easy right yeah you keep the camera locked off you take out your lights you maybe adjust your exposure or bounce some light in a different way and you shoot a clean plate yeah, and there's lots of shots that we did that, like in the face of this lady at the top of the stairs in the main entrance hall. Like lots of lights are in that scene; you can't see any of them in the final piece. But what if it's not a static shot? If it's not a static <laughs> shot. It's very complicated. Yeah, because you basically have to have a motion track, a, a, a motion track rig. Yeah, and we've done a lot of experiments trying to do it without having a motion track rig, and I'm sure you can do it, but it will cost you. A lot of time and money, mm -hmm. like a lot of time and money. More That's than almost the better just figure out a different way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, each of the opening shots for episodes two through six were captured on on a motion control rig. Um, 
to do the pullback from the computer screen. And, and that ain't cheap. And that ain't cheap by itself. Yeah, but we used a pretty like uh, a pretty hacked together version that uh, Scott Lynch had uh, has created. So okay, like cool. kudos to him and his engineering talent. Um, it was it was it was very lo-fi, but it it gets the job done because you just need it to be consistent speed. Those shots still took our lead senior compositor like well over a week to do, mm. and and they were they were very difficult visual effects shots, but they looked great, and we were able to execute them and um, paint out lights and do screen replacements and all that jazz. And so kudos to the team. Yeah, it's really. I mean, I can't wait to see more of it. You know, the clip that you shared is amazing. Um, so my last question for on just on the because we already talked about all the 3D stuff, and I think you answered all that. That like you want to be shooting 3D as much as possible, uh, and that oh, I'm assuming again that you did mono previously just because of the the technical balance. Just lean more towards mono, right? For time, really post tr- time and post right gotcha. like. Post production time in stereo, everything takes so much longer. I mean, we have 300 visual effects shots in D mine, and right. to do that, oh, it's just insane. Yeah, just an insane amount of money and time. So, I my last thing though is about the the because uh, it looks like you offer this on your site for uh, uh, for a live preview with VR NDI. Yeah. So, have you got this figured out for stereoscopic? Because we love. <laughs> Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we wait. absolutely do. Um, so you know what you have to do is build a ST map, a stereoscopic ST map. Mm-hmm. We're big fans of the Canon dual fisheye. Obviously, it's a great lens. Um, and we've used some tools developed by Andrew Hazelin, who yep. has worked in. Uh, he just has a bunch of free the Carta VR stuff. Incredible. That's what we're we use for our post. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you make a if you make an ST map uh-huh. in that, you can then use assimilate live effects to okay. get your SDI or HDMI input into the computer, unwrap both eyes, and then use VR NDI to look at it inside a headset. Actually, if you're using Scratch, you don't need VR NDI, to be quite honest. Because uh, the current chipped version of VR NDI, you have to be plugged into the computer, but Scratch will just do it for you. Oh, sweet. Um, which is great. So you'll have a stereoscopic preview. Uh, I, have a, I have a little bit of a special piece of kit that we just have for light sale that allows wireless uh, VR NDI. Oh, yeah. So, when we were on the set of all these productions, we had, you know, every department had had a VR headset. The directors walk around with VR headset, the DPS VR headset, and all of us are able to look at stuff together during the take live while it's happening and, and spot things that don't work. And, you know, filmmaking, as you know, is iterative. So take one, rarely the right take. So we go and we make adjustments, you know, we hide some camera shadows and tweak some lights, you know, stuff like that. Um, and to get, you know, really good. I think that live preview on set is one of the things that I feel like has really elevated these productions. It's given creatives the confidence and executives the confidence to know that, like, hey, we're doing something very cool here, and we, we do know that it's going to work. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it t- it's taking the guesswork out of a lot of it, and that's why I was, like, excited to see that you were offering something because I hadn't found a solution yet, and we desperately could use one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to, if you're gonna go out on a production, you know, on this level and not have like a preview, that's just crazy to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how we've been going for a while. <laughs> yeah. Just I mean, like, we've 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 tried it and we've had, we've hacked together. With different cameras and stuff, but yeah, not with the. It's never really worked in the way that we wanted it to. Yeah. Um, now, simulate live effects, honestly, is the game changer for on set. And, you know, Light Sales partners with Assimilate, and we do a bunch of work with them on the virtual production side as well. But, like, in terms of immersive, like, live preview, there's no better tool out there. It's just great. So I brought a clip from The Faceless Lady. This is from episode one. And um, the story of The Faceless Lady is that three couples are invited to this castle to participate in games to win the castle. Um, and this is the kickoff of the rules and the introduction to the first game. And, you know, we chose this clip because we think it's a really good setup for the series, but also some of the camera motion and the staging in this, I think is particularly great. Uh, and it really looks good in stereo. So, you know, enjoy. There are only two requirements for these contests, love and commitment. Commitment to playing the games and your love for one another. I'm very sensible shoes, apparently. Can I say, I'm a comfort girl. So, 
Can you allow us some words? When do we start? Oh, Tom, it's just the hand of fame. We already have. So, is this like a tradition? The games, I mean, sir. In a sense, yes, though perhaps somewhat different. You see, 350 years ago, a massacre occurred within these walls. One which turned a great romance into a needless tragedy. Oh, uh, you're talking about the headless woman. The faceless lady, she had a head. And a name. Margaret? Lady Margaret, actually. So how much of this story was actually true? No, the story is true, though it remains incomplete, which is why you are all here. Over the next 36 hours, we will recreate the events of that fateful night, Siege of Killer Castle. And as on that night, the winner shall inherit everything. I'm sorry, we're being filmed for this, right? You think this is a TV show? Obviously. Games, castles, the prize. I can assure you, there are no cameras. And now, the first game awaits. Before we begin, the rules are simple. Rule number one, when you hear the carnix, the round has begun. And as on that historic night, time is precious. Rule number two, under no circumstances should you attempt to leave the grounds. For any reason. Is that disqualification? Finally, these games are a war of attrition. Each round will eliminate one player. The last man or woman standing wins. The siege began with the death of a sentry. This is so dang. You shall each take turns to throw the axe. The first to knock the sentry off his perch wins. And now that we're back, we're hoping that y'all really enjoyed that as much as we did. Yeah, I, think I thought it was. Amazing. I thought it was great. I'm so that shot at the end there, where the camera just lifts up. Yeah. How. How did that happen? How did you guys do that? So we had the camera, um, we had a, the camera kind of on a dolly, on track, and on a jib. And the reason why the camera lived on a jib a lot of the time was if you're going to have track, you have to have the camera extend out over the tracks. So mm -hmm. You don't see it when you look straight down. Yep. Um, and so, you know, because we had that we were able to you know do some cool things raising up and, and really play with the movement of the camera and i really have to say that i think you know john ross the director on this is a master at moving the camera and he watched a lot of films i think one of the big touchstones was orson wells's citizen kane for mm -hmm. this project mm -hmm. because it's a film where these uh, scenes play out in tableaus with really deep focus with kind of slow and very prescribed camera moves. And it became like kind of a real textbook example for what we think works in this medium. And and we lifted a few things out of that for sure. The old becomes new again. You um, one thing that I also really <laughs> noticed in, and we talked about it a little bit is that there's that shot where they, they're walking across the field and yeah. the camera is moving on two axes yeah. at the same it's like, time. It's like breaking three rules. And it yeah, and it's perfectly. something that we've like, talked about. We're like, oh, absolutely never do this. I mean, last episode I said, yeah, only one axis, axis at, at a time. time. Even um, Eli that, says this. That is yeah. still true. Like, yeah. like, one axis at a time, absolutely like a fair bit. But, you know, like all rules, rules can be broken. Yeah. yeah. And what makes that piece work is that you have an anchor point. Mm -hmm. You have the characters on the screen that you're following and they maintain the exact same distance and the exact same screen like position point in space mm -hmm. for the majority of that move. And even at the end, when we whip over the door, you still have your it's your eyes that go to Quinn at the door, and your eyes are going with the move. Everything we did with this show, the important thesis was where is the audience looking? Anticipate where the audience is looking and where they want to look and where you need them to look. And as long as your camera motion affirmed that mm -hmm. audiences won't get sick it's when you do a move like that but then you like create action on the other side of the frame that causes someone to turn back that's where nausea comes into play mm. you know what um that was it was great I, I thought the 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 color on it was fantastic um uh, i hope it looks in in as good yeah. in 
meta TV Me- as as the clip that you gave us? I mean, I think it does. It's we when we do our color, we work with Jeff Caesar from Dungeon Beach in Brooklyn. He's a phenomenal colorist. We had a really cool pipeline on this show where we actually converted it all to an RE log four pipeline. Oh. Uh, which I think just has some nice sh- uh, highlight roll off. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we did a full real grade in DaVinci Resolve on this, and it looks really, really nice. And it's formatted, uh, sorry, it's colored specifically for the Quest VR headsets. Yeah. So the P3 color space with Gamma 2.2, it looks the same when we're doing our color session as it does in Horizon Worlds as it does in MetaQuest TV. Wow. You know, if you watch this in Horizon Worlds, it's a different experience because there's obviously avatars and like a 3D mm-hmm. environment around it um, and it's lower resolution, you know. So if you really want the full cinematic experience, um, head to MetaQuest TV as well, where you can see it like in its 8K glory and it really feels good. Awesome. You know, Matt, I, I think we're uh, coming to the end here. Um, thank you so much for, for yeah. being here. You were really a pleasure to have on. Um, uh, do you have any last thoughts for us? No, I really hope. Um, I'm not sure when this is dropping, but uh, Faceless Lady comes out April 4th on uh, Horizon World. Subscribe to it, add it, talk about it. And if you have any thoughts, please get in touch and share them with me because I'm really, I think we've pushed the envelope here. I think we did some really unique things. I want to know what people think because. There's not a lot of narrative series that have been done in VR, um, and I, you know, I really want us to to keep doing more. So I hope we get the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, super excited about it. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, cool. Appreciate thank you both. Yeah. Have a fun time today. Adios. Thanks, man. Take care.